Missy Brandt, a flight attendant from St. Paul, Minnesota, met Derek Aldred on Our Time, a dating site for people over 50. She'd been swiping for days, sifting through dozens of desperate, sad, and secretly married men in the St. Paul area before finding Aldred. However, he went by Richie Peterson at the time. Richie was a 45-year-old retired war veteran studying to be a political science professor. Like Missy, he had multiple kids. Missy liked his profile, hoping the only decent guy on this site would message back. A few minutes later, her wish came true. Richie sent her a message. They sent messages back and forth, exchanged phone numbers, and talked on the phone all afternoon. Missy wanted to meet him, but Richie was vacationing in Hawaii at the time, so the two planned a date when he came home from vacation. A couple weeks later, Missy met Richie for the first time. He was even more impressive in person. Richie spoke intelligently, listened, and seemed interested in a serious relationship. Eventually, Missy decided to introduce Richie to her three daughters. It was a big risk, but it paid off. Her girls ended up liking Richie. He took them on boat rides, they dined at nice restaurants, they even went on fun trips where Richie usually put them up in a four-star hotel. Missy thought she'd found the perfect man. He seemed to check off every box on her list. Though, there was one problem. Richie's life was a mess. He started canceling their date plans a few months into the relationship. He texted Missy saying he had to check his daughter into rehab, put down the family dog, and spend nights in the hospital. Richie told Missy that he suffered from chronic ailments sustained from military combat in Afghanistan. Missy picked Richie up from the hospital numerous times, despite her frustration with him. Every time something terrible happened to Richie, she was there for him. She stuck with Richie when his mom died and when he got into a motorcycle accident, among other tragedies. The more time Richie spent dealing with his bad luck, the less time he spent with Missy and her kids. And the bad luck was only getting worse. But Missy never questioned why Richie's life seemed cursed. Then, she looked in his wallet. One day, while they were spending time together at her house, Missy grabbed Richie's wallet and looked inside. Missy, when looking back, says she had a nagging feeling like an instinctual urge to look. There was something off about Richie. She opened the wallet and took out his ID. Missy was expecting to see the name Richie Peterson. Instead, she read the name Derek Mylan Aldred with a picture of Richie printed next to it. Missy dug deeper and found several credit cards belonging to someone named Linda Dias. Missy put everything back and closed the wallet. Her trust in Richie, or Derek, was now destroyed. Who was Linda, though? His wife? Ex-wife? Girlfriend? Missy didn't know. She did know that her relationship with Richie was over. Now, he was Derek. Once Missy was alone, she googled Aldred, half expecting nothing important to show up. Instead, mugshots bombarded the search results. Aldred's face was in every single one. Missy read the website titles and articles underneath the mugshots. They said things like career con man and master of deception. At first, Missy didn't know what to do with this information. Most people would call the cops. However, Missy didn't want Aldred getting away as he appears to have committed several times in the past. Missy found, in great detail, a laundry list of Aldred's crimes on the internet. Then, Missy says, she remembered the name of Aldred's credit cards, Linda. And after some more intense research, Missy found her. She sent Linda a Facebook message, hoping she'd respond. Missy waited until Linda finally messaged back, though it wasn't what she expected. Missy wasn't what Linda expected either. She initially thought Missy was a jealous ex-girlfriend trying to break her and Aldred up. Yes, Linda thought she was dating Aldred too, though she called him Rich. Linda, a retired military vet, met Aldred on our time as well. He manipulated her the same way as Missy. For example, Aldred knew Linda was a conservative Christian and made sure to say a prayer on their first date. Linda went on several more dates with Aldred, who claimed to have a purple heart. Eventually, she started inviting him over. But when she lost her job, Aldred invited Linda to move in with him, and she said yes. In fact, Linda was sitting in Aldred's house when she first read Missy's message. Linda answered cautiously, still assuming Missy was a jealous ex. Then she opened the links Missy sent. The links took Linda to Aldred's mugshots. Linda recalled reading the list of crimes and staring at the photos, thinking, how do I get him out of the house? The two women devised a plan to do just that. Get Aldred out of the house where the police could safely arrest him. Aldred put their plan in motion when he asked Linda to drive him to the hospital again. Something was bothering him. Linda eagerly drove him to the ER, dropped him off, then called the police on her way home. The authorities arrested Aldred and took him into custody. They called to let Linda know they had him. She relayed that information to Missy. Both women were relieved to have Aldred out of their lives, but now they had to deal with the repercussions of letting him in. Linda looked at her bank 
statements after Aldred's arrest and figured out how Rich made their time together worth his while. Aldred found Linda's emergency credit cards while snooping around in her jewelry box. He snatched the cards, called the companies, and ordered copies of each one. Then he used them to fund his successful-looking lifestyle. The fancy boat, four-star hotels, expensive restaurants, and fun trips to Hawaii were all paid for with Linda's money. She also discovered her shrunken retirement fund, realizing Aldred pilfered that too. Now Linda found herself unemployed, in six-figure debts, and hardly any savings to fall back on. She also had to pay Aldred's rent since the lease was in her name. Missy and Linda also figured out why Aldred needed to visit the hospital so often. It was his swapping place where one of his girlfriends dropped him off and another picked him up. The question Linda and Missy had now was, how many other girlfriends did Aldred have? Linda, who was still living in Aldred's house, received a package addressed to the con man himself. The package contained a bottle of whiskey, chocolate, and a get well soon card by a woman named Joy. Linda read the sender's address and realized Joy only lived a few neighborhoods away from her. She contacted Missy and told her about the package. The two women decided to contact Joy and tell her the truth about Aldred. Instead of talking to Joy directly, Missy and Linda compiled a collection of articles on Derek Aldred. They left them on Joy's doorstep along with their contact info. Joy responded immediately. Linda invited Joy over to her house where the two swapped their oddly similar stories. Joy, an IT professional, met Aldred, or Rich, on our time. Aldred told Joy he was a professor and volunteered at homeless shelters on the weekends. After dating the flaky professor, Joy broke up with him after a few months. She couldn't handle all the chaotic life tragedies. However, Joy had a change of heart after Aldred texted her a photo of him smiling on his boat with Missy that said, Life's going good. Just bought a boat. I've been taking my sister and her kids out for rides. My life has calmed down. Want to give us another shot? That's when Joy put together the package with the get well soon note, not knowing she was inviting a con artist back into her life who'd stolen $8,000 worth of jewelry, her passport, and her birth certificate. Joy didn't discover the items were missing until she read the articles about Aldred's past crimes. The St. Paul duo quickly became a trio after Joy bonded with Linda over wine and a shared experience, having your life ruined by Aldred. They, of course, knew they weren't the only victim. While Missy sifted through old criminal records, she found a name. Most of Aldred's victims chose to remain anonymous or only use their first names. However, one woman, Cindy Partini, provided her full name. Cindy is a Silicon Valley professional from San Francisco. Aldred stole her savings and destroyed her credit score. He gave Cindy a critical mission, fight for his other victims. Because Cindy's name was publicly available, many of Aldred's shyer victims contacted her for support. Cindy became the unofficial leader of the anti-Aldred club. When the St. Paul trio messaged Cindy, they had no idea what they were getting into. Cindy was obsessed with taking down Aldred. Missy and Linda started messaging Cindy more and more and put her in contact with other Aldred victims. The trio soon turned into a quartet and their quartet evolved into a network. Even though many of them lived in different parts of the country, the Aldred victims found community in each other's shared experiences. And they would need to stay together now more than ever. Aldred was on the loose once again. When Linda had Aldred arrested at the hospital, the cops only held the con man for 48 hours before releasing him with plans to find a more substantial charge to peg him with. But as expected, the police took several weeks to find more charges. By that time, Aldred was out of Dodge and his whereabouts unknown. The Aldred victims were beyond frustrated. How could someone like Aldred get away again and again after committing so many crimes? Aldred primarily scammed his victims via credit card fraud and transferring money from savings accounts, which is difficult to prove if you're close to someone. Linda lived with Aldred. They, on paper at least, bought groceries together, paid the bills together, paid rent together. Since their finances were so intertwined, Aldred can make a reasonable he said, she said argument. She said, I stole her credit card information, but I say she gave it to me willingly. The Aldred victims needed to catch Aldred doing something bad. Bad enough to keep him in jail for more than 48 hours. With Aldred on the loose, Missy, Linda, Joy, and Cindy spent countless hours on the internet and social media looking for any new headlines and warning women that Aldred might be in their city or town. The Aldred victims had figured out the type of woman he liked to con. Professional career woman in their 40s and 50s, preferably divorced with children. To track Aldred, Missy messaged his cousin-in-law, Vicky, asking if she she knew where he was. She told Missy that Aldred had fled Minnesota and stayed at his mother's house in Sedona, Arizona. After seeing the mugshots and listening to the victim stories, Vicky decided to call the police on her cousin. Aldred had an outstanding warrant for DUI in Arizona. However, the Sedona police only kept Aldred in custody for four days. After Aldred fled Arizona, the network only found leads after they'd been victimized. They welcomed the new victims into the community while agonizing over how close they were to catching Aldred. The victims turned sleuths felt hopeless and isolated at times. 
Despite their efforts, Aldred was still ruining their lives, and they had to hear every new victim story over and over again. However, the Aldred victims weren't the only ones looking for the con man. Aldred's most recent victim, Tracy Cunningham, received a call from NCIS asking if she could help them catch Aldred. Unbeknownst to the victim's network, NCIS had been investigating Aldred since his DUI arrest. He first caught their attention when he impersonated an ex-Navy SEAL. They quickly realized why Aldred was masquerading as a former SEAL and contacted Tracy. Fortunately, Tracy had broken up with Aldred before he could steal anything. But for NCIS to find him, they needed Tracy to take him back. So Tracy sent Aldred a message. She apologized for being, as she put it, hormonal and said she hoped they could start over. Aldred said yes and asked if she could pick him up from a doctor's appointment. Tracy agreed. When Aldred texted her that he was ready to be picked up, Tracy told NCIS, then drove to the medical clinic. The agents were already there when Tracy pulled up, but she still got there in time to see Aldred get carried away in cuffs. She snapped photos of Aldred as the agents dragged him along. Tracy remembers them telling her to put the camera down, but capturing this moment was more important than following the rules. Tracy knew some women who might be interested in seeing these photos. Tracy sent the picture to the Aldred victim she knew, and they sent it to victims and that they knew until the news was everywhere. Missy, Linda, Joy, and Cindy all messaged each other in victim group chats, fantasizing about Aldred's future in prison, which seemed inevitable. All of Aldred's victims gave their evidence to NCIS. With their help, NCIS CIS built a very strong case against Aldred, ensuring he wouldn't get away this time. In late 2017, Aldred pleaded guilty to three counts of fraud, including two counts of identity theft. He was subsequently tried in a Texas court, even though Aldred committed his many crimes all across America. With the help of Missy, Cindy, Linda, and Joy, NCIS estimated there are 25 known victims. These victims lived in Minnesota, Texas, California, Hawaii, and Nevada. The courts ordered Aldred to pay each victim restitution, which added up to over 250 thousand dollars. They also slapped him with a 24-year prison sentence, ending in 2038 when Aldred is 77. Click here to watch one of these next videos, and let us know in the comments section whether or not you think online dating is making dating better or worse in 2022.